a man looks at a computer screen. Up. Graham Young is blind. You're moving it up and down. Up. Yet he can see. Down. Derek Steen feels pain in an arm that no longer exists. He holds a golf club in one hand. John Sharon sometimes believes he is God. My attitude was I was God, and then I had heaven and hell in my eyes. I was the, the grand guy who created heaven and hell. In a living room, a young man stares at an older couple. David Silvera is convinced his parents are imposters. It can look like my father. It can look identical to him, exactly like him, but it's not him. These people are not crazy. They have all suffered damage in tiny sections of their brains that has profoundly distorted the way they perceive themselves and the world around them. In the past, these bizarre cases would have been dismissed by science. But today, one neuroscientist tracks them down with the dogged persistence of a detective. What excites me is I can go in there and pretend I'm Sherlock Holmes and try and figure out what has gone wrong in this patient's brain, what's changed that accounts for the strange symptoms. And this, of course, is a lot of fun to do because you're learning a lot about the brain, learning a lot about what causes the symptoms in that particular patient. But more importantly, it's telling you about how the normal human brain works and how the activity of neurons in the normal brain gives rise to conscious experience and gives rise to the whole spectrum of abilities that we call human nature. A man studies a brain scan on a computer monitor. Can the misfortune of brain injury shed light on the workings of the normal brain? Perhaps even help solve some of the eternal riddles of human nature? Understanding the human brain is one of the ultimate challenges in science. Corporate funding for NOVA is provided by Sprint and the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Additional funding is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Words appear. Secrets of the Mind, written and directed by Christopher Rollins. Now in a hospital room, a doctor wiggles his index fingers as an elderly patient stares at them. Watch my two fingers. Do you see my two fingers? Dr. Villanur Ramachandran is revolutionizing our understanding of how the brain works. His efforts to solve some of the most baffling neurological mysteries take him from the hospital bed to the outer limits of brain science. The human brain is without any doubt the most complexly organized form of matter in the universe. The brain is made up of 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. Someone has calculated that the number of possible permutations and combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. And this gives you some idea of the staggering complexity one is faced with in trying to understand the functions of this mysterious organ. So the question is, how do you even begin? Now in a bar. Ramachandran began his investigations with a strange phenomenon called phantom limb syndrome. It's not uncommon for amputees to feel the vivid presence of a missing limb long after it has gone. A one-armed man plays pool. Now he drives an old Chevy. One of Ramachandran's first patients was Derek Steen. Derek steers with his right hand. 13 years ago, I was involved in a motorcycle accident, and I pulled the nerves out of my spinal cord up in my neck. They told my parents directly that I would never use my arm again. On a golf course. About seven years ago, I was reading through the classifieds, and I saw an ad in there, uh, amputees wanted. I thought it was a joke. Like that. It's just basically connecting the club to the ball. So I called the number, and it was Dr. Ramachandran. 
Today, Derek is teaching Ramachandran how to play golf. The doctor tees off. But several years ago, Derek made a crucial contribution to Ramachandran's pioneering work in brain science. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> After my surgery, I sat up in the bed and still felt the arm there, still felt everything there. And I'm looking down and I'm seeing nothing. <laughs> it was pretty bizarre. The more I thought about it, the more it hurt. The more it hurt, the more I thought about it. So it was, it was like, it was never ending. I mean, I'd break out in a cold sweat and turn pale just standing here talking to you because the pain would hit so bad. If there is any one thing about our existence that we take for granted, it's the fact that we have a body. Each of us has a body and, you know, you give it a name, it has a bank account and so on and so forth. Uh, but it turns out even your body is something that you construct in your mind. And this is what we call your body image. Now, of course, in my case, it's substantiated by the fact that I, there really is a body with bone and tissue. But the sense I have, the internal sense I have of, of the presence of a body and arms and all of that is, of course, constructed in my brain and it's in my mind. And the most striking evidence for this comes from these patients who have had an amputation and continue to feel the presence of the missing hand. Derek makes a short putt. It was the beginning of an important relationship. Important for Derek, because not only would he finally understand his phantom pain, he would also get to the bottom of a mysterious sensation he felt while shaving. In his bathroom, Derek shaves. When I first started shaving after my surgery, I would feel my absent hand start to hurt and tingle whenever I shaved this left side of my face. Meeting Derek was important for Ramachandran because the explanation he came up with would rock the world of neuroscience. How about that? That's just my arm. The first thing Ramachandran did was to invite Derek to his lab for a simple test. Derek, I'm gonna to touch different parts of your body and I just want you to tell me what you feel and where you experience the sensation, okay? Okay. Close your eyes. He touches Derek's forehead with a Q-tip. You could feel that on my forehead. Anything anywhere else? No. Okay. It's on my nose. Okay. My chest. Your chest, okay. He touches his left cheek. I can feel that on my cheek and I can feel rubbing on the phantom left hand. On the phantom left hand, mm -hmm. in addition to your cheek. I'm gonna run the Q-tip across your jaw and see what happens. I can feel a Q-tip on my cheek and I can feel a stroking sensation across the phantom hand. You actually feel it stroking across your phantom hand, mm -hmm. across the palm. So here is a medical mystery of sorts. Why does this happen? Why would a person, when you touch his face, claim that it's also touching his missing phantom fingers? That's fine. Palm. Thumb and palm. This was just the kind of mystery that Ramachandran was drawn to. Now in Derek's driveway although it would take some time to solve. One day, while Derek was making one-armed repairs on his favorite Chevy, Ramachandran turned up with his solution. It was a groundbreaking theory. The reason we think it happens is that in the brain, there is a complete map of the surface of the body. The entire left side of my body, the skin surface, is mapped on to the right side of my brain along a vertical strip of cortex which we call the somatosensory cortex. Similarly, the right side of my body is represented on the left side of my brain. Animation shows the somatosensory cortex as a strip across the top of the brain. So every point on your body surface has a corresponding point on this body map. On an animated brain segment, a face lies beside a hand. Now it turns out that the representation of the face on this map is right next to the representation of the hand. Now that's a bit surprising, as you'd expect the map to be continuous and faithfully represent the left side of my body. But it doesn't. Back in Derek's driveway. Now imagine what would happen if the left arm were amputated. The part of the brain corresponding to the hand no longer gets any input. And it's hungry for new sensory input, so to speak. Computer animation. The sensory signals from the face normally activate only the face area that's right next to the hand area. But they now invade the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand and start activating the hand region in the brain. And so whatever is reading those signals higher up 
misinterprets those signals. It says those signals are coming from the missing hand. So you experience the sensations as coming from the missing fingers, even though I'm touching your face. And this is showing there's been a massive reorganization of the sensory pathways in your brain after the amputation. And it's as though there's been a cross-wiring in your brain. Which, exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. At first, some members of the neuroscience community scoffed at Ramachandran's new theory that neural pathways in the brain can change. One of the dogmas in neurology has always been that connections are laid down in the fetus in an early infancy. And once these connections are laid down, there's nothing you can do to change them. Now in a hospital. As a scientist, Ramachandran knew that such a radical proposal needed scientific proof. It was time to give Derek a brain scan. Hopefully, this would show what was actually going on in his brain. But would it prove that Ramachandran's hunch was correct? When various parts of Derek's body were wired up, the corresponding activity in his brain revealed the layout of his body map. This is a scan of Derek's brain. The green spot shows the brain's response to the stimulation of Derek's existing right hand. Next to it, the red spot shows that the right side of Derek's face is also being stimulated. So far, everything is normal. But in the right hemisphere, the green spot has disappeared because Derek's missing left arm can no longer send signals to his brain. Remarkably, the red area, which corresponds to his left cheek, has now taken over the whole space. These results vindicated Ramachandran's detective work. It's as though now the sensory input from the face is innervating a completely new part of the brain. And this means new pathways have been opened up. Whether this is because there's been an actual sprouting of new nerve fibers, or there have been pre-existing silent pathways, which are now suddenly active, we're still working on. We suggested that maybe the connections are already there, like reserve troops ready to be called into action. And when you amputate the hand, these latent connections suddenly become active. In the bar, Derek plays pool. Phantom sensations do not only occur in the limbs. But in fact, you can get a phantom with almost any part of the body. You can get phantom menstrual cramps after hysterectomy. You can get phantom appendix pain even after the appendix has been removed. Theoretically, you could have a phantom of almost any part of the body except, of course, the brain. You can't have a phantom brain by definition, because that's why we think it's all happening. Luckily for Derek, his phantom pain has subsided. But that's not always the case. James Peacock has suffered excruciating pain since he lost his hand six years ago. A few days after I'd woke up, you know, it might have been a week to uh, eight or nine days, something like that, before the pain really started getting bad. You know, to where it was like your hand is just crunched up real tight and stuff or balled up, you know, and you can't move it. It's unclenched. It's just, you can't. You've tried in your mind. This raises a perplexing clinical problem. How do you treat pain in a body part that's missing? James tried everything, from painkillers to hypnotism, but nothing worked. Until I found out about the mirror box. It was then that he came to see Ramachandran. And one answer might be that the brain is sending signals to the arm uh, and trying to clench it. But in you and me, uh, there's messages going back from the muscles of the hand telling you you're clenching too much or too fast. And this damps the, the command signals so you can, you can slow down. But the patient has no feedback because he doesn't have an arm. So the brain says, send even more signals, OK? And this goes on. And you get into a sort of positive feedback loop. So I said, well, if you give him some, some other source of feedback, such as visual feedback, Maybe that'll trick the brain into thinking that the hand is clenching or unclenching, and maybe you can interrupt this loop. So I said, well, why don't we put a mirror there and have James look inside the mirror? It's just as though you have visually resurrected the phantom limb. And of course, the patient knows it's an illusion, but it's very, very compelling. Right now, as you look in there and you move your hand, your phantom does the same thing 
as your left hand is doing. James appears to wiggle 10 fingers. First time I got in here and I've done this and it was just like, it relieved the phantom pain, unclenched it. You know, it was just, oh, so intriguing, you know. You, sometimes it's just, it's hard to explain how you felt, you know. Ramachandran believes the mirror box needs to be evaluated with many patients before he can be sure that it really works. But its undeniable success in uncramping James's phantom hand suggests that even pain can be a construct of the mind. Smiling, James clenches his left hand, then stretches out his fingers. The phenomenon of phantom limbs reveals how our brains can delude us into being conscious of something that isn't there. But Ramachandran has come across an even stranger condition, a remarkable ability of the brain that allows you to see even though you are totally blind. This rare condition is called blind sight. In his car, Ramachandran drives around a curve. His surroundings become blurry. Ramachandran found Graham Young in Oxford, England. He is one of the world's few known blind sight patients. This paradoxical condition shows just how much our brains run our lives without our being aware of it. Well, when I, when I was eight, when I had the accident, it was a road accident that, that caused brain damage. Um, I literally used to walk into lampposts. Um, I ran into, you know, these huge, great pillars that you get in stations? I ran into one of those one day. Animation shows a three-dimensional human brain. The main visual centers in humans occupy nearly half the brain, in a large region towards the back of the head. Graham's vision was devastated by the accident. Today, he can see to the left, but is blind to everything on the right, in both eyes. If you put an object in that part of the field and ask him what is it, he has no idea. He cannot perceive it consciously. Graham stares at a square on a computer screen. And yet the remarkable thing is, if you move this object, he will tell you which direction it's moving, even though he cannot see the object. Down, up. You can see things over here. Oh, yes, I can see. I'm going to move my hand across. You tell me when it appears, when, you, when it, it comes into view. Now. Very precisely. Uh, as it enters the seeing part of your field. Yeah. And if I just hold over here and you look there, you can't see anything? No. How about now? You're moving it up and down. But you're seeing it. It's very easy for me to say to you, oh, I saw that, move up, Colin. Yeah. And as soon as I, I say that, you're going to say, ah, he can see. No, I can't. A hypothesis sufficient. Colin Blakemore is an Oxford scientist for whom Graham's mysterious abilities raise intriguing questions about consciousness. Colin walks with Ramachandra. I mean, blind sight is extraordinary when you, you see it. It's shocking. I think it's shocking because it brings home the fact that we can actually manage our brains without consciousness to some extent. And that leads to the question, well then... Why not everything? Why not everything? And why do we need consciousness for certain things? What is the extra gloss that consciousness gives, if anything, to our actions? Now Graham watches the square on the computer screen. Right. I'm aware of individual functions of sight. Sometimes I'm aware of a motion, but that motion has no shape, no color, no depth, no form, no contrast. Sometimes I can tell you what orientation it's at, but then we lose everything else. So what you lack is the ability to put it all together to and to recognize an object, a thing, yeah. something with meaning. Colin Blakemore. Well, blind sight is this term introduced by Larry Weisskrantz to describe the ability of people like Graham to detect things, but not to be aware of them. So very, very different from what we would normally call vision. Right. If there's one thing that this phenomenon of blind sight teaches us, it is that vision is not entirely seeing, that there can be a disconnection from the capacity to respond to visual information. Uh, and the actual act of being visually aware of something. Those two things can be separated and probably are in our everyday lives. But the problem is that obviously we're not aware of the things that we're not aware of. We just don't know the extent to which they play a part. V.S. Ramachandran. It's almost as if the patient is using ESP. He can see and yet cannot see. So it's a paradox. It's almost like science fiction. How is this possible? Well, if you look at the anatomy, you can begin to explain this curious syndrome. It turns out from the eyeball to the higher centers in the brain where you interpret the visual image, 
There's not just one pathway, there are two separate pathways which subserve different